as we finish up praying here, I'd like Jessica to come up and uh, quote for us this morning. Again, like I say, I'm always grateful for all these ones that put in so much hard work. Good morning. Today I'm going to be quoting Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach to the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Because they exchanged the truth, because he exchanged the glory of the immoral God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonor of their bodies among themselves, and exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations to women and were consumed with passion for one another, men, committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their heir. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'd like to acknowledge, while you're turning there, Melvin and Mariah. Could you stand up, Melvin and Mariah? Woo! Melvin, Melvin came to me several months ago and asked if it would be all right if um, the youth learned scripture. And I thought that would be a great idea. 
which is all I've had to do with it besides asking, is there anything more we can do for you? But they're doing it all on their own. Uh, they're doing a great job. I just uh, appreciate their heart for that. I appreciate all the hard work that the youth have put in doing that. That's God working supernaturally in a natural way. So thank God for them and thank God for our youth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, it says, and you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. I am so glad you always keep me in your thoughts and that you're followers of the teachings that I passed on to you. Um, Paul starts out by saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And like I said last week, what a daunting thing to say that I would ask you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. If you imitated me like I imitate Christ, what would that look like? And I want you to know that, that in the passage today, it talks about even angels watching the way that we behave. Um, in Hebrews, it talks about we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that um, last night I watched the football game, sadly. And, um, <laughs> but I had to think about the stadium of people and all the people across the nation that were watching that game. And that's nothing compared to who's watching you. And the, and the real, it's not a game, but the, the, but the lives that we're living. And so when I say to you all, you know, imitate Paul or imitate Christ or imitate me as I imitate those people, um, it's like, well, what do you mean imitate you? What does that look like? Imitate Paul, what does that look like? And it's, it's what I keep saying, and it, it might be, you might be getting sick of hearing it, but it's what's best for the kingdom of God. Is your life laid out so that you're doing what's best for the kingdom of God? Um, in walking around shoe leather that looks like that you're living the kind of a life that other Christians can look at and that you're an example. That they can look at you and go, I don't know what it is that that other fellow Christian has, but I want some of that. And then what comes out of, then after that, what comes out of your mouth? I mean, first you have to live it, because if you just go around saying it, but you're not living it. I've heard some people say some things before, and I would remember looking at past their words Sometimes you can look past people's words sometimes and look at them and go, I don't want to be like you. I don't like that. I don't want any of that. Um, but if they do have those admirable kind of lives and then they speak to you in encouragement, that means something to you. So be the kind of person that people care what you say. And then if you are that person, say the things that build up your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Secondly, you have to, in that you have to sometimes say things that are unpleasant. Confrontation is, is part of leadership. It's like saying you can do better. And I would say that there's a method that my wife and daughter and several people have learned. It's called the Suzuki method of instruments, to play an instrument. And for every 10 positive things you say, then you can make a withdrawal. You say, now I would like to correct you on this. So you're constantly pouring into the person positive. Every now and then there's an ask. I think that's a good ratio. I mean, it's, it's not scriptural. It's not biblical. But it sure is a good principle. That if you bring up the good points in somebody, bring up the good points in people, tell them the positive things that God has to say about them, then when it's time to correct, they know it's coming from a place of goodwill, not of nitpicking or not of fault finding. So it's important that we do that for other people, that we give a proper example, that we give an encouraging word, and that we also are correcting properly, humbly, and in a way that is effective. And you can judge that for yourself. Is my correction effective, or does it just make them resent me and push people away? So we're building us up, the brothers and sisters in the Lord, we're building them up. And then that's not where it ends for Christianity because we're also reaching out, reaching out to the world around us. So when I say, what's best for the kingdom of God, you have to say, what's best for the world out there? What's best for my testimony? And again, example. The way you live speaks volumes about Jesus Christ. There, You hear a phrase sometimes that says, um, you know, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Well, that's true. We should always be preaching the gospel with the way we live. 
But I want you to know it's always necessary to use words also. You must always speak the gospel plainly as well. I'm reminded of a story of a man. He worked in, a, in an office setting for years, and when it came to his retirement party, they gave him a cake, and he's a wonderful guy, and they said, you're one of his um, co-workers said to him, you're a really great worker, and you have such a positive attitude. We were all wondering around the office, are you a Buddhist? And the guy was like, he felt like he'd been stabbed in the heart because he was trying to be a good Christian testimony all these years. You have to also <laughs> articulate it. The gospel must be articulated and lived. It's not one or the other. Which should I do, lifestyle Christianity or word Christianity? It's both. They're both essential. If you just go around spouting the words, and again, is your testimony effective? Or is it a word fitly spoken? So you need to do both. And that's what he means when he talks about living our lives for the eternal kingdom, what's best for the kingdom of God. And um, I'm reminded of an old, old phrase, it goes back in Christianity a long time, it's only one life so soon will pass, and only what's done for Christ will last. We have to keep that in mind every day. What am I doing for the eternal? Will this matter 100 years from now? Now, the second part, it says on verse 3, but there's one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So he's putting down a, a, a principle of the Bible there. He's getting ready to talk about head coverings and length of hair. What a fun passage for me to teach, and what a wonderful way to start it. <laughs> but we don't shy away from the Bible. I find the Bible to be very refreshing in that it's not politically correct. It's not couched in political correctness. It says what it means, and it means what it says. Here it's talking about order, that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is her man, and the head of Christ is God the Father. That is the order of things. It is not, I want you to know that's an order statement, not a value statement. Is Christ less than God the Father? Absolutely not. It's done in order. I want you to know that the author of confusion of this world is the devil. Chaos is the way he likes to run things. And disorder, Whatever, whatever's in order, he likes to disrupt that order. So that's the devil's work to do that. There's nothing, I, I can't stand that in, our, that in our society that a mother is deemed less than the president, that a teenager is deemed less than a rich man, that a poor person or homeless person is deemed less than, you know, your middle class American. And God... We're all equal, and we're all created in the image of God. It's called the Imago Dei, the image of God, that each one of us were created that way. We all have value and worth individually. That's where our individual freedoms come from. That's the, that individual freedom or God-given rights is one of the founding principles of our country. And each person gets to make bad decisions. Each person gets to decide for themselves. <coughs> individually and suffer the consequences for them. That's the way God made each one of us. That's why Christianity is not a thug religion where we tell you what to do. It's where we tell you what the Bible says and you decide what you do. It's up to you what you do with God's truth. And the truth must be presented in such a way that the presentation isn't offensive, even if the content might offend you. So it's a matter of order. And I want you to know in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, we turned there last week. It's interesting because we were talking about being a children of Abraham. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it says, You're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all have been united with him in baptism, have been put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now what he's saying is one in value. 
The Bible's not denying that there's different genders. God made male and female, but there's different roles. And when we embrace our roles, it's beautiful. When we deny the roles and overthrow the roles, it's chaos. It's trouble. Now, he's going to apply this, and I want you to be very careful, and and I'm going to read this through so that you'll understand it. As he says at the very end of this verse, he says, we have no other um, custom among us. Is that there's a principle he's going to talk about here that is exclusive to their culture. So I'm going to say, this is what the Bible says, but culturally this is what it means. And I'm very rare to say that, because you can explain away the Bible if you go, oh, that's just cultural, that's just cultural, that's just cultural. But the way that we establish doctrine, what's really real and what we will stand on firmly is if Jesus Christ taught it in the Gospels. It was practiced in the book of Acts, and it was expounded on in the letters to the church. So Jesus taught it, it was practiced in Acts, And then it's also talked about in the churches. So if you just find one passage, one place where it talks about something, don't just take that and run with it. It has to be a thread going through the word of God. It says, so let's wade in here. It says, um, a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while he is praying or prophesying in verse 4. A woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if he refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all of her hair. But since that's shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head to be shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for a man is made in God's image and reflects the glory of God. A woman reflects the man's glory, for the first man didn't come from a woman, but the first woman came from a man. And a man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show that she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from a man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that that is disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. So can you see where in this passage that next week all you women have to wear a hat or something? And that men should never wear hats in church? The question is, in our culture, does wearing a hat show disrespect when you're inside? Like when I was in the military, That was called our cover. And you wore it always, but if you walked inside with it, you you got dropped for push-ups immediately and probably someone screaming at you. Back in the culture, probably 30, 40 years ago, there would be a principal, sometimes a principal would stand by the door and when kids came in with their hats on, he'd be knocking their hats off of their head. You don't wear that hat inside. You don't put a hat on a bar. You don't put a hat on a table. Does any of that make any sense nowadays? No. No. So whether you wore a hat or didn't wear a hat, it wouldn't make a difference as far as being disrespectful or respectful. Back in Corinth, that wasn't the case. Women back then were veiled if they were unavailable. And if they took that veil off, that covering off, that means I'm available. So much so that the prostitutes of the day would take their head coverings off and actually have shorn heads. That would identify them as temple prostitutes, which was very common in the day. What had happened was the women of this church had went, we're free in Christ. So we don't have to be sensitive to the culture. And it was sending mixed signals to the people around, as you can imagine. 
I mean, what kind of church is that? Those women all have no head coverings on. Are they loose? Are they prostitutes? Are they, what, what's going on there? So, again, it comes down to what's best for the kingdom of God. Now, order is important, and authority structure is important, but how is that shown? Um, that's why I say this, it's written here, it's the Bible, but it's the custom of the day. It's the culture of the day. In India, for instance, I'll give you an example. It's not unusual at all to see a woman over there, and she is bare from here to her waist, which in our culture would be like, what's she trying to say? You know, that's pretty provocative. But if you wore a completely nice and modest shirt, but you were show showing your shoulders, oh boy. It's almost like you're naked over there. You don't show your shoulders over there, but you can show your midriff. So if you're a Christian over there, what would you do? Be sensitive to their culture. And that's what the Bible is saying, be sensitive to culture. This can happen in churches, too. Like, we do things a certain way in this church, and I can just tell you straight out, there are some people that come in here and go, that's very unorganized. That, I mean, this whole thing where you just got to get up and fellowship with each other, that's pandemonium. And announcements, what's that? You know, it's like there's a disorganization to this church that drives some people crazy. <laughs> some are already crazy. Um, <laughs> I want you to know that that's not thoughtless. That's the way this church began. That's the way that church, this church was, and that's the way the church will be. Because we are informal. We are more like a family gathering. We are more loose like that. So there's a part of me that looks like to tighten things up, keep it moving. We're on a schedule. And I'll just say culturally, right here, it talks about length of hair. I think women should have long hair and men should have short hair. That's how I feel culturally. I can't back that up in the Bible. Even here it says, a man, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Does it say it's a sin? No. So, and it, does it teach it throughout the Bible? Did Jesus teach it? Is it in the book of Acts? Is it talked about in? Nope. So feel free if you're a guy, grow your hair long. I don't care. Well, I do care, but the Bible doesn't say anything about it. I'll think you're a darn hippie. I'll think you're a hippie, but who cares what I think? I think you look scruffy, but what does it matter what I think? And, and like every time a woman gets a haircut, they're like, how, do you, how does it look? I'm like, I'm always to myself, it looks better longer. <laughs> I like long hair. But that's just my opinion. You can have short hair if you're a woman. It doesn't disrespect your husband in our culture. It doesn't send the wrong signal to anybody. That's just my preference. So I like you short-haired men. You look very, very masculine. And I like you long-haired women. That's very beautiful. You other people, nah. <laughs> nah. It, it really is like, it really is. It doesn't matter what I think. That's something between you and your spouse, and you and the Lord. And the way we dress, and the way we act, and the way we are with each other, and how sensitive we are to culture, it really is under that big, gigantic setting, what's best for the kingdom of God. So in verse 17, it says, but in the... In the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you have God's approval will be recognized. Do you hear the sarcasm there? Well, you guys got to divide up. That way you'll know who's better. That's what he's saying. And this also can bleed back into the last category of cultures and churches. Is our church the best church because we're informal? Because we don't wear suits and ties and there's no stained glass here? <laughs> Is our church better because I don't wear a suit and tie? Or is it worse? And that's a lot of times churches like to compare themselves with each other and go, oh, our church is better. Well, I would never do. 
I want you to know, if they proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, they're, they're part of us. When we take shots at them, you're taking a shot at yourself. We are the body of Christ, those who claim Christ. We claim Christ alone to save us. We're all on the same team. Different churches are getting it done with different styles in different cultures. As long as they don't sacrifice the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't criticize them. Don't think yourself better than them. I mean, I, the one thing I like about our church is that there's all different kind of people here. You know, I would hate for people to walk in here and go, this is the Republican church, Democrats aren't welcome. Or vice versa. Or, you know, we're, we're, they're that kind of church. We don't allow those kind of people. What's those kind of people? <laughs> I resemble those kind of people remarks. <laughs> a lot of us were those kind of people. We all need Jesus. It needs to be open and welcoming. I mean, if a few of you wore suits and ties, it wouldn't bother me at all. So be like, I've known people who said, well, that guy's wearing a suit and tie. He doesn't belong in our church. I don't mean this one, but in other churches I went to. I'm like, What? The kingdom of God is not a suit and tie, brother. I wish more of you wore suits and ties so that if a suit and tie guy walked in, he'd be like, hey, there's people like me here too. So whatever you want to do, do in that respect because we're an open enough culture out here, I think, that you can do what you want to do. And I think that's the way it should be. So, but the idea of dividing up into groups so that one can be right and one can be wrong that starts in middle school. And we need to grow out of middle school. <laughs> we need to divide on one thing and one thing alone. That's the authority of Scripture and Jesus Christ alone. Period. That's where it ends. It says, um, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with the others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. They had used communion. and In reading about this and in studying for this and looking at commentaries about this, I couldn't be more proud of you all as a church. They're all like, Communion used to be something different than it is today. Communion wasn't just little pieces of bread and little cups. Communion was when they all got together for a meal and shared with each other because they were all believers. It would, be, it would behoove the church to get back to that practice, is what all of them said. And I went, yeehaw. That's awesome. I'm so glad that you guys are of that heart and of that mind and of that soul that you love to get together in God's name and share a meal. And one, one guy said that they had outgrown it, and I, I just said in my heart, we'll never outgrow that. If we outgrow that, <laughs> um, something's wrong, you know? Something's wrong when we can't share each other's prayer requests, can't share each other's lives, can't share a meal together. I don't care if it's inconvenient, we have to move half the chairs, it doesn't matter. It's about togetherness. It's about preferring people among yourself. But I want you to know something. He says that some of them are glutted, and some of them are drunk, and some of them are going hungry. They'd split up into their own little factions, their own little groups. And I want you to know that's a natural thing for people to do, but you have to fight that. As the church grows larger, you might not know everybody's name. Not everyone's my dad. Um, <laughs> Some, one or two of you may know everyone's name. But you're not going to know everyone's name. The key is to get to know the people you know better and to introduce yourself to new people. At a communion, no one should feel left out. If you see somebody you don't know or somebody sitting by themselves, go talk to them. Approach them, get to know them. They might not be your cup of tea, but you meet people that you have things in common with and then you form friendships and natural groups. Because our church just isn't going to be about setting up programs to mix you all together. 
That's just going to happen naturally or it won't happen at all. Because it's not a church of programs, it's a church of people. We're going to nurture and grow each other. It says in verse 23, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it in pieces. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So this idea of communion is for us to get together and keep remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. There's nothing more unattractive than a prideful Christian. And I think pride has crippled the church of Christ more than any other sin. When the world looks at the church, do they see prideful or do they see humble? Do they see judgmental or do they see loving? And it's, it's our goal to stay loving and stay humble. And if you're constantly in the presence of, in the conscious remembering of what Jesus did so that you could be right with God, that is a sobering thing, but that is a humbling thing, and it's a joyful thing that you could be in the presence of God going, because of his sacrifice, I'm good. I'm good with God. There's peace between him and I because of the goodness of God, because of his sacrifice, because of his body and his blood. And I want you to know, much has been made about communion as a sacrament. And so some, some people believe that it's actual, actually the body and actually the blood of Jesus. That's called transubstantiation. Big words. <laughs> this means that they think it's literally the body and the blood of Christ. But when Jesus said this, he said, this is my body and this is my blood, and he was alive when he said it. So it obviously wasn't his obvious real body and blood. It was symbolic of his body and blood. And so we say it's a memorial or a remembrance. I want you to know that it's, it's both. It's, it's supernatural is what it is. When we get together as a body of Christ and take communion, something supernaturally is happening there. It's not just a symbol. It's a miraculous occurrence because what it is is you all individually are the body of Christ as a whole. We form a body here. And to, to acknowledge that through his body and his blood, the bread and the wine, and to do that collectively is to collectively become one. And there's a healing power in that. There's a cleansing power in that. That's why the, the grace of God is poured out on the church. is because he is blessing, sanctifying, energizing his people as we come together in his name. That's simply all we're doing. When we get up and pray, when we get up and sing, when we get up and teach, we're going, you're God. And because you are God and because of who you are, I can be right with you because of your son. Period. Nothing more than that. That's the gospel message. That's the powerful, simple message that we give to other people. And the thing that clutters it up is our prideful ways of trying to make ourselves distinct and individual so that we can be better, worse, or whatever than other people. And those lines need to come down. And being around other people, those lines come down. I'm reminded again, I, I caught up with an old friend. We didn't actually talk, but I kind of rubbed up against him a little bit. He had left the church the last time that I met him. He's a really holy guy. Well, he was actually a wreck. And then he got holy. He got so holy that coming to church would be a downer for him because he had such a wonderful walk with God individually. But when he got around you all, just brought him down because you're so carnal. He talked about such horrible things. And he found Christians to be disgusting because they were so unspiritual. And I listened to that in horror. And I went, wow, <laughs> that's the most unchristlike thing I've ever heard, I told him. 
He said, what? I said, Jesus loved people so much he was around them all the time and sacrificed for them. You love Jesus so much you hate people. How's that work? How's that the heart of God? How's that the Holy Spirit living in you? That you would... And I, like I said, that's the last time I talked to him. And this time I rubbed up against him about four or five... It's been four, five, six years. It is worse. That guy... Slinging hatred. But he's got a Bible. He's doing it in the name of the Bible, in the name of God. I want you to know, just because you have a Bible, you do things in the name of God, you can be the most wicked person in the world. You can have all your doctrine right. You can do all your P's and Q's and be a hateful, pinheaded person that just drives people away from God. You can present the gospel in such a way that it's repulsive. And you can be just as sincere in your heart when you're doing it. We can never be less than, less than truthful, and we can never be less than loving. You can go beyond love and you can go beyond truth, but you can never be less than those two. So this idea of dividing ourselves up is... It, it manifests itself in the communion meal, and it's a dangerous thing to do. In verse 27, it says, So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So this is quite an amazing thing that he talks about, some of them being glutted and some of them being drunk. And that because they're dishonoring the communion festival like that, they're taking the body and blood of Christ like it's nothing. They're kind of trampling it and making a mockery out of it. He says, many are sick among you and weak, and some of you have died. That's what I mean about the supernatural part of it. Because there's an energizing force in doing it the right way, and there's a degenerating force doing it the wrong way. What's interesting, he says, if God disciplines you or judges you in this way, He's doing it so you will not be condemned along with the world. Now me, again, in my judgmental self, when I hear about how these guys are doing communion, what would I do? What's your judgment of these people? Probably not even saved. That's not even a good church. What does he say about them? You're hurting yourselves, man. You're wrecking yourselves. And God's doing that so you come around because you're not going to be condemned with the world. There's no getting into a category where you're condemned with the world. God just keeps turning it up because he's going to correct his children. God corrects his children. Do you believe that? I've experienced it. <laughs> I know he corrects his children. How far will he correct you? Right up to the point of death. He cares more about your soul than he cares about your physical being. Do you know that? And he will get you wherever it takes for you to listen. Sometimes he gets you right by the wallet. <laughs> Sometimes he gets you in physical things. Sometimes he gets you relationally. Whatever it is you hold dear and you think God would never touch, he will touch that. Because he cares about your soul a lot more that he cares about your convenience. I want you to know, though, that does not give you carte blanche to do that to other people. I've seen people use those kind of verses and those kind of concepts of God to be mean and rough with other people. I want you to know that every time the Bible talks about you correcting someone else, it talks about control, gentleness, kindness, and the way you want to be treated. It doesn't say, well, that's it. We're going to take the kid gloves off and go after you. It's all, there are no rules now because I love you. Uh-uh. 
That's not God. That's the devil. That's heresy. You're not God. Don't confuse yourself with God. It's a good concept right there. That's one for me. Don't confuse yourself with God. There's a God and you're not him. He tells us the way to correct people. Very gently, kind, in the way you want to be treated. And you have to check to see if your correction is being effective. If you are effectively driving someone further away, stop. Stop. If you're damaging the other person, stop. That relationship, let God correct them. Do you think God cannot correct them? He's got all, he's got all means. He doesn't need you and your manipulation. So there is an honoring that God gives to us, but it says examine yourself before eating the bread. That's why sometimes we pause and say, is there anything in my life that says I shouldn't be eating this right now? But I want you to know the emphasis of this examination is how are you doing with your friends and neighbors? How are you doing in your relationships? Are you unified? Are you willing to be made unified? He says, examine yourself in verse 28. He says, examine yourself in verse 31. It doesn't say examine other people in this particular instance. In this particular instance, it's right to do that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, it says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Do you, are you a hateful person? Are you angry all the time? Are you disconfitted? You can't get along? What's wrong? You need to ask yourself. I, I don't believe in denying your feelings. I believe you should listen to your feelings like you should watch dash lights on a car. You should look at them and go, something's happening here with my car. The oil light's on. The check engine light's on. The, those are indicators. But I'd suggest you look up when you're driving. Don't drive with your indicators. They're not everything. Don't drive with your feelings. They're not everything. But they are to be paid attention to because they are saying there's something inside of you that you need to deal with. So examine yourself. So dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you the instructions about other matters when I arrive. So... When there's a potluck, it's just like simple. Don't eat all the food before I get there. I won't eat all the food before you get there. If you go through the line first, take it easy. You know, be kind and generous and considerate of other, of other people. Like I said, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because I don't know a group of people who are more generous or do that thing better. But just because we're doing it great now doesn't mean... We won't lose track of it. It says, um, think about others. Make each other stronger. When you think what's best for the kingdom of God, it's making other people stronger around you. And then it's reaching out to the lost and dying world. If your Christianity is one where you are a vibrant considerate person, a person full of love and joy, then when you speak salvation, people are like, that's real. But if your life doesn't back it up and you speak God's word, people go, I don't want any of that. That's not what I want. So be imitators of Christ. He was all about this kingdom. He gave up his status to reach out to a lost and dying world. He wasn't just a sacrificial lamb. He also was a friend that put up with people who were way below him spiritually. His disciples were a mess, but he didn't forsake them. Sometimes you went, oh, <laughs> that's okay. Sometimes you go, huh, but keep going. People are worth it. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for your word. Even in correction again in, in Corinth, we see ourselves. And we see an opportunity, Lord, for us to avoid pitfalls that they made. It's uh, ridiculous to think we could not fall the same way. It's ridiculous to think that those tendencies aren't in us. So I pray that um, if we're doing well in that, great. And if we're not, Lord, help us to examine ourselves and to get back to what's best for the kingdom of God, what's best for your eternal glory, what's best for the people around us, and that we would stay away from the things that focus on us, that focus on our fulfillment, but we would look at the fulfillment of others and the betterment of others. Thanks again. In Jesus' name, amen.